All right, so the process usually will be that you'll want to copy the previous folder, the previous day's folder, and name it to today's date. Um, now, here's a trick if you don't know this in, in Windows, you might already know that you can do right click copy and then right click paste the folder. Sure, but here's the trick if you, um, if you right click and drag, so right now I'm, I'm holding down right click. If you right click and drag uh, the particular folder in question and then you let it go, a pop up appears, which also then says copy or move. You'd want to copy it. So I think that's a, a good shortcut there. If you want to make a copy of a folder quickly, you can right click, drag it, let go of the right click, and then cop, uh, copy it. And it'll do the automatic of copy and paste in one swoop. This is the same as doing right click, copy, and then right click, paste. But if you right click and drag, you get that option as well. I made a copy of that, and then I'm putting the day's date. So then, of course, at the end of the day, I will put my code into the folder with the latest date. So in your project folder, whatever you call these, what, however you organize yourself, that's what I'm going to generically say in your project folder, whether it's the date or whatever way you organize yourself. Uh, from the project folder, we're going to uh, edit the index and the JavaScript. And here's another trick. If you um, click to select index and then control click to select the JavaScript that'll select them both you, you should know that you can control click items to select more than one but the trick is if you then right click any one of them you will be able to edit both of them at once instead of right click edit notepad one and then right click edit notepad the other you can select them both and you'll get the ability to edit in your editor both at the same time so that's another little time saver so let's open the index file and let's open the JavaScript file. Uh, just to remind myself where we're at, I'm going to run the code uh, up, up to this point. You want to get in the habit, especially when you rerun the code. You know, when you're in Notepad and you run it from here, you want to get in the habit of uh, right away uh, pressing F12 to bring up your console. As we get more complex in JavaScript, there'll definitely be more errors and more minor errors. Oh, I misspelled something. So bringing up the console as soon as possible will save you time uh, in debugging because you might have an error right away that you need to fix before the issue that you think you have to fix. And in Firefox, the console appears below. Um, I kind of like it on the right side, so you can move it to the right side with this icon here. There's close the console, undock it, and move it to the right. Obviously, if it's at the bottom, it'll still work fine. But based on the size of my screen and such, usually for me, it's more helpful to have it on the right. So you can just click that icon. And the same icon will then move it um, back to the bottom if you want. Now, uh, we'll also be looking at something really cool as as the time goes on in the class in that the browsers can behave somewhat like a mobile device. Uh, I think the one in Chrome is better, which I'll look at in a moment. But if you're in Firefox, you can also do this. There's a little icon right here that's uh, supposed to be like a little phone that's responsive design mode. If you click on that, that'll, that'll reshape your window to the size of various devices. So if you click on that, you get a tall like this. You get a bunch of options at the top regarding snapshots and other cool things. And it also says no device selected. Well, from there, you can click. You can emulate different devices, like uh, Google Nexus 5 or iPad. Samsung S, Galaxy S7. 
So my screen's a little small to fully show you this. Uh, your screens are a little larger. But uh, I think that's going to be useful, especially when we get a little bit later into the class, where there's a way to turn on this responsive mode, which then lets you emulate a device. You can even rotate it. There's a little rotate button there. So it's sort of like experimenting with your project on a device, but in the browser. And Chrome has something very similar. I'll show that briefly. If you run this in Chrome, F12, you get your console there. Looks a little different than Firefox, but same idea. And on theirs, theirs is a little more obvious, I think. There's a little icon right there, Toggle Device Toolbar. That activates also a uh, mobile-friendly view that can emulate a device. Responsive. Galaxy phone, iPhone phone. The Nexus 5 one also looks even a little bit more like a, like a device. You have the back and home buttons of an Android, plus a little uh, status bar at the top. Oh, look, I have pretty good reception in here for once. Uh, so you could look at it in there and again uh, then you've got zoom in zoom out and different ways to, to work with this like uh, rotating it so portrait landscape hmm. I hadn't seen this one uh, you can do a rotation and then also look at it as if you're in landscape keyboard view so you get an overlay of the of the Android keyboard just to see on this kind of a device you only have a very small amount of screen real estate as you type on the keyboard. So you can experiment with that. Okay, back to what I was about to do. So um, I was just going to test it of uh, how it was at this point. We're setting up our sign up uh, process. So I'm testing it out with passwords that don't match. Join. I should get the passwords don't match message. And then when I create passwords that do match, I get some feedback. Passwords do match. And then you can look at the storage inspector. local storage so I have saved something I'm starting to set up the process to save an account in the beginning levels of this project we're going to use the very relatively basic concept of local storage which saves a simple key and value pair of data it's like a cookie or a file that has a name and it has one value inside of it. Uh, I have here the password cats, but it could be a whole phrase. Cats are great exclamation point 99. That would be a valid value that I could save into my data. So I'm not saying simply that, um, I'm not saying that that um, the data here is one literal word. It's just that there's one value, which is a string, which could have letters and numbers and symbols. That's a password that I could accept as this user. And I'm saying this in, in terms of contrasting later on, we will do more complex databases where it's much uh, more complex data that is uh, stored in our system. Uh, if you want a very early preview of it, we won't get to it until like four weeks or something. If you want to start looking this up now, you can make a note. If you look up something called PouchDB, this is the database that we're going to use eventually. It is a JavaScript database in the NoSQL paradigm. So it, in short answer, it doesn't require a server. 
most databases operate on a server. Oracle, uh, MySQL, SQL, etc. There's a whole new generation of uh, databases now um, that are called NoSQL databases, so PouchDB, MongoDB, etc. that don't need anything special except a web browser. And technically the data is being saved in the web browser. And again, we'll get to all of that much more complex a lot later. And that saves a lot of data and it has synchronization and all that great stuff. So you can make a note of it and look at it later. We'll get to it later. For the moment, the simple way that we're saving our data just for the user sign in, sign out is local storage. And local storage works in every browser and every device. Eventually when we get this to a real device, iPhone, Android, iPad, whatever, it'll also work in the device to save simple uh, key and value pairs of data. This is all we really need for um, our login logout. Um, it is bare bones in terms of there's no encryption going on. This data, if you could, you know, actually hack into the the storage area of the browser, you'd be able to read the data plain text most likely. So it's fine, it's okay for us at this point, but we would want to make it more secure as time goes on with encryption. Uh, and there, there isn't quite like a JavaScript command that says dot encrypt. Um, not, not quite. Okay, so what I've got, if this is working at this point, all that I'm doing is I'm confirming that the passwords match. And I'm confirming that I can save data to local storage. Let's get back to our JavaScript code, to the line where that all happens, somewhere near the end, in my case, line 65. One of the last lines that we wrote, line 65, local storage dot set item with what is the name of the cookie, comma, what is the data in the cookie, which is uh, the uppercase version of the email and the uppercase version of the password. So that's allowing us to save this simple data. We're going to use this and our knowledge of conditional statements that we have so far to check uh, does the account exist uh, does it not we've checked with if else before um, do the values of the passwords match okay that's one level do they match the next level in deeper okay passwords match does the user exist if the user exists tell them you already exist just sign in if the user doesn't exist, okay, actually then save the data, and now they have an account so that they can log in. So in the else block of the if else, we're going to have uh, another if else. So in my code, line 66, I've got end if else statement. I'm going to have more than one if else statement so I can lose track of these things. I'm going to refine this to say end of if else statement checking uh, if user is logged in or not actually uh, oh if passwords match okay uh, end if else statement if passwords match this if this if else statement if I follow it back ultimately is in charge of checking if passwords match If you back up one line before the if else statement ends, this is where we need to write our code. And uh, this example of local storage here, let's comment it out. Um, that, that does work to save the data, but we don't want to simply save it yet. We still want to check, does the user exist? So make sure you comment out this one, or else it'll be redundant when we set it up again under another if-else statement. And this is 
why I would recommend as soon as possible, here's our skeleton of our if-else statement, as soon as possible, fill in the opening and closing brackets and such before actually filling in the data, because you might lose track of that. Without this note here, this curly brace, where did it come from? What does it end? What does it do? With our note, this is our if-else statement, the passwords match. This if-else will be the end of if-else if the user exists. And if else statement to check if user exists. So all that will happen in this block is to check does the user exist. Okay, so what we're checking in the parentheses, again, is always if something is true. If the user exists, true, or else it's false, they don't exist. Or we can also ask it in the opposite way. If the user doesn't exist, that's a true, so it does the first part, or else, no, that's not true, they do exist. So we're going to check here if the user does exist, and the user is based on their email address. So what we're doing here is in the parentheses local storage dot get item before we set an item before we save the user we need to check does the user exist and we can do that by trying to get the item trying to uh, retrieve a value inside of a key. So we've got a value of a password saved with a key name. Therefore what we're trying to do here is get item that email in question. Temp val in email sign up. Uh, yes, good point. Up is uppercase. Sign up. Thank you. So that was an example. I did that on purpose. This was an example of when uh, you select something, Notepad uh, doesn't take into account capitalization. I selected it just to confirm that I spelled it right, and it did highlight here as well as where I created it. But it's not taking into account capitalization. That fooled me. I was moving on, but then, thank you, you pointed out capital U. So um, be careful about that. When I selected it and it was lowercase, it still said, great, here it is and here it is. But nope, this is uppercase, this is lowercase. Confirm that that's correct. Okay, after the parentheses, then we'll have equals, 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 space, null. So let's write a note above this. Check in the local storage area of the device to see if there is data in a cookie named the value. Uh, named the person's email. Check in the local storage area of the device to see if there is data in a cookie named the person's email. To determine if the user account exists. 
And I wrote here the multi-line comment. I've been writing single line comments several times. Um, this might be more efficient. But you remember to open and close your, your comment. Whereas uh, the single line is just a double slash. So make sure that's correct. But the point of this if else is that I'm checking. Let's try to get an item based on the person's email address, the one that's trying to currently sign up, whatever that is. Let's check. Equals 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 is to check. It is to check equality as well as type. Uh, later on, this will make this will be more important. Where we check: Does this value equal this value? Is this number the same as that number? Is this letter the same as that letter? Uh, so this is three equal signs together, no spaces. So those are three equal signs. And that's technically, technically checking equality as well as type, uh, same type. Check equality and type. Data types, data types like is it a number? Is it a letter? Is it a Boolean? And here, is it a null? Null would be, we're trying to get a cookie from memory. The cookie doesn't exist, it's going to return null, meaning it doesn't exist. There's nothing here. There's no data anywhere in the memory inside of a value called temp, inside of a key called temp val in sign up. So basically, we're saying, is, very short answer, is the account empty. That's what this is checking. True console log user doesn't exist. Else User does exist. Since I commented out the line before, set item. We're not saving any accounts yet. I deactivated it. We can at least test it, though. Save your work, run it in the browser. Uh, try creating accounts that don't exist. Um, you know, make up a brand new person. See if you can get some output. You should really only get the doesn't exist, even if you match your passwords, because we don't have the actual part that saves the user. But I want to check so far that our code works here, that um, it should not see that your user exists. Um, if you have previously saved an account, you could try to log in with that, or you could try to create the account with that, you probably will get the does exist. So let me confirm it on mine. I'm going to refresh, try to sign up. So. Start with um, something else. Join output user doesn't exist. So I'm trying to sign in with Bruce Wayne password match. Uh, user doesn't exist. I haven't uh, tried to create that account yet. Now I did previously create B Wayne. So if I try with B Wayne, join, user does exist. So all of that works because of these, these lines here. Using local storage object. We use either get item or set item method to store or retrieve data from the device. Currently, my web browser. Eventually, a real Android or iPhone or tablet or whatever. 
in the first step to creating an account, it's really interesting because obviously we use apps and we create an account and it all works. But we then have to think about it on a higher level when we create these things. Well, a person needs to exist before they can log in, but we need a way for them to log in. Okay, but then we need to check, do they already exist? So it's kind of circular logic as you develop these things sometimes. And ultimately, you've got the starting point that fixes the catch-22. I can't log in until I have an account, but I don't have a way to create an account. And I don't have a way to test it because I don't have a user, but I don't have a way to create an account. So we start off, okay, here's our first step. Let's check if a user exists before we try to create an account. Uh, did that work for everyone? Did you get an either exists or not exists? If we get some of this feedback, doesn't exist, here is where we then actually save the account. This commented line up here now should go, should exist in the part over here. User doesn't exist. That account doesn't exist, so let's save that account. I'm going to actually cut it and paste it right there. <coughs> so the line from Thursday, set item, I've moved it out of line 65. And I put it into this new if else statement. Cut and paste it. You can copy and paste it as long as you leave it commented out above. I cut and paste it. And now, now that I've checked, okay, that user doesn't exist. I've I've found it's true that they don't exist. There's no data in that cookie. Let's save some data in that cookie. The password, the name of the cookie. Set it. Save it and run it again. And now try to create different accounts, different passwords. You should still see either user exists or not. If you try to sign in with an email that does exist, it should tell you user does exist. If you then try to sign in with or sign up, with an with a email that doesn't exist, it'll it should tell you. To kind of make it more obvious, also that it's working. Here we said user doesn't exist. Save the user. Another console output might be useful to say user saved. And then to see this, uh, you can also you can also note which user just got saved. So some concatenation. We're saying the words user saved colon space plus and also display what was the email address in question. So the user that was saved was based on that email address. So it doesn't exist, then save it, confirm that we've saved, who did we save? When we've been testing these uh, forms, uh, the submit form, remember early on in this function of sign up, early on in the whole sign up function, at the very beginning we had prevent default. The default behavior was that the form would have emptied itself. Uh, and we had a way over here somewhere about emptying those forms, or right here. Uh, password sign up and confirm if there was mismatched passwords we cleared those two fields 
um, for them to try to put their password in again. Uh, I want to clear the fields again if they've properly signed in. But a smarter way, because now I want to clear all of the fields, not two out of three, is we have a way to reset the whole form. The way above, we reset two out of the three fields. I don't want them to have to retype their email. That's annoying. I just want them to retype the missed, mistyped passwords. Well, now, if this works, I want the, the, the form to be reset. So we can uh, reference the, the form, the whole form itself, $L form sign up. brackets zero dot reset user doesn't exist so save the user account and then um, after success, successfully saving a new user, reset the whole form. It's got kind of strange syntax here. Uh, if you know anything about JavaScript uh, and arrays, we'll be talking about arrays later. Um, this seems like it's array syntax. It's the zeroth item of the array, the first item. Um, it's just sort of weird syntax, this is just the way it is, because we've used jQuery to create a reference to the form. We're trying to reset uh, that form, uh, the zero width version of it. Uh, just That's just the way it is, don't worry. And so here we're resetting the whole form if they successfully signed in. So that does that little bit of extra user experience in, I've successfully filled in the form and I've successfully created the account so reset the form I don't have to work with it anymore empty it let me check mine see how it's going Gonna sign up now you might notice I'm going back to the home screen and then refreshing because remember if you're in the sign up and then you do refresh you lose your back button so I'm just gonna refresh from home sign up I'm going to create a brand new one. Join. Kozol is not defined. No one, no one jumped out of their seat to tell me console. I misspelled console. Thank you. you find out. Exactly, I planned it. Kozol. Right? Of course. <laughs> console log. Okay, so console log is fixed. And uh, anyway, if it wasn't, then it would tell me there, go, go check your line 75. <coughs> okay. As you're testing this, you, you won't have it uh, exactly later, but as you're testing this, you can press enter on the keyboard. It should also find your enter without having to click join. And when we get it to a real device and you get your device's keyboard, you will be able to press the enter on the device as well uh, to register the, the click on join. Because that join button is a submit button, it automatically uh, is sort of waiting to be clicked either with enter or with enter on the keyboard. Anyway, so what I've got right here in my case it's got all of this output. OK, we clicked Sign Up back on line 31. We've confirmed these are the things that are about to be saved, 39, 40, 41. I get my if else statement that says the passwords do match, line 57. Uh, that gets us into our second if else. User doesn't exist. I have not ever created an account with vCampus before. So line 72 tells me user doesn't exist. And then finally, after uh, set item, I have user saved. The user that was saved was, was this which is with the uppercase, 975. The second number is also the column from left to right. Uh, I don't trust that one as much as simply line number. But the second number is supposed to tell you how many spaces over the error is. 
although that doesn't isn't as useful as you would think. So on line 75, column 5, then I get the final output that says that the user got saved. Oh, and my form got reset, just like I was expecting. If your form didn't clear itself out after successfully joining, uh, confirm your code. That's a 0, not an O. If it's an O, I'll say O. If it's a 0, I'll say 0. The second part of this if-else, user does exist. We need to give the person some feedback on screen. User already exists. At the moment, we're only giving ourselves feedback in the console. I want some sort of pop-up to happen for the user that lets them know your account already exists. Well, like we had our pop-up for passwords don't match. We're going to do something very similar. Uh, I think we've already set ourselves up a little bit. Let me just confirm something. In the index, um, yeah, in the index file, line 43, just to look at something here. Last time, what we did on in the HTML file, we created a div data role pop up to have the message passwords don't match. And while we were there last week, we also created a div, line 44. Uh, pop-up um, account already exists. So we have already something that we've created as a way that will pop up that will say account already exists. It has a unique ID. Pop error sign up exists. Some sort of pop-up that is an error in the sign up screen. In this case, account exists. In the JavaScript, what we did at the beginning, we created then JavaScript references or objects of those divs. So back on line 15 and 16, element pop up, blah, 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 that div, comma, that element pointed to that div. So we have ourselves set up to use the pop up. The, uh, the user already exists pop-up. We used it, line 49, we initialized the pop-up, that div is going to behave like a pop-up, so in the method, and then we referenced the div again, and then actually made it pop-up, we made it open, we made it animate. So we need pretty much exactly that same sort of syntax, but for the error, account already exists. So in in our continuing in our else, which is the whole area that the user does exist, you're trying to sign you're trying to sign up with the same account dollar, because it's a jQuery object, pop error sign up exists that's the object dot pop up method all lowercase there that initializes it that prepares it for um, behaving like a pop-up uh, so the first line makes it or uh, prepares it to be a pop-up the second uh, instance of the same code then that's when we say pop-up plus any options such as animation. It was uh, open, I believe, yep, open. Quotes, open, we want the pop-up to actually open, comma, curly braces, any options here, such as the position where to appear, uh, what sort of animation to use. Transition.
slip. Go ahead and test that. Um, try to create an account that you know exists. And technically, it's only checking if the email has been saved. If you try to create an account with an email that exists but with a different password, it's still the same thing. All of these accounts are tied to the person's email, just like any real app or real uh, website. So try to log in with an or try to sign up with an account that does exist, and you should get the pop-up that then says, um, user account already exists. Let me check mine. So I know I've got uh, V at Campos. sign up exists is not defined hmm. okay probably misspelled something here let me check line 80 in my case pop error sign up exists uh, hmm. so if I go back oh it's the L it's the element version not the original ID okay so uh, what I did here is uh, in my case uh, I'm referencing the actual ID of the HTML node, not the jQuery, not the JavaScript name of the object. So if you wrote it exactly as I did, whoops, I made a mistake. That one I will cop to it. That one was a mistake. I didn't do that one on purpose. Um, but that one was, I was referencing the ID and not the element, which is L pop-up. Most of the time, I'm going to be dealing with L elements throughout my JavaScript code, so I should have paid attention there. So both of these are L, pop. These are the element. These are, uh, these are the J, uh, J, jQuery objects. These are the JavaScript objects, so let's fix that. Sorry about that. That is L, pop up. Because we're in the world of JavaScript, we are referencing things with a JavaScript name. We're referencing the objects with a JavaScript name. So I shouldn't have been referencing the uh, ID, which is what the thing is called in HTML. I can't quite reach out to grab it that way. I have to do it in a different way. But here uh, we're dealing with the object's name in JavaScript. So now if I test it, uh, that should seem right. I'm going to try to sign up again with an existing account. Okay, there we go. I get the pop-up. Account already exists. So what's happening here is it initiated the whole sign-up function. This is what I'm trying to sign in with. V at Campos, password bats, passwords do match user does exist and the result of that is then I get the pop-up that flips into view account already exists
In this case, it wouldn't be useful. I don't think it would be useful to empty those fields because a lot of us, you know, we, we're in a hurry. So we're doing stuff and then kind of at a certain point just kind of clicking things. If then I'm trying to join and I get a pop-up and I didn't really pay attention to and I closed it and everything reset on screen, what happened? I didn't notice what I just did. So in this case, it would be a good idea to not clear out to those fields so that even if they miss, what did that pop-up say? I closed it so fast. Oh, and everything's still filled in here. Oh, I realize I already have this account. There is also a way to set this up so that the pop-up does not close uh, unless you click something in the pop-up. Right now, technically, if you click outside of the pop-up, it closes it. But there's a way to force it that it only will close from a button so that a person actually sees it, that it will, that they'll read it and they'll click close. I have to look up what that what that code is. That might be nice to add because again, people they're they're in a hurry and they click things and close things and what did I just do? So we can set it so that that doesn't close until they explicitly close it to let them know, "Hey, you're trying to log in with an account that does exist." Also, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to clear out those fields so that they see, "Oh, this already exists." Let's pause right here then. Um, you should be getting this feedback if your account exists or not. Um, that should work. And then what we'll do is uh, we'll further set up this process. But any questions at this point? Does it make sense overall in the code? General questions on the code so far? Any, anyone need a little help in what the code does? I'm going to put a copy of my code up to this point in the network folder in case people need it. I'm going to put a temporary copy of my code. <coughs> Today's date, TMP. So if anyone needs a code up to this point, mine seems to work. If you'd like a copy up to that point, there it is there. Um, does that work for everyone? Anyone need a little help with that working? We dealt with an if else statement to check if the account work if the account exists or not. A good bit of user experience of user interface design is okay, great. The account was just created in this first block. User saved. We have some feedback for ourselves. In the console, the user got saved. The regular person is never going to see that. Honest, uh, honest answer here. How many of you ever browse people's websites and you have your console open? How many of you are browsing Google and going to Facebook? And how many of you ever have this console open just to see what's going on behind the scenes? No one? No one does that for fun? Okay. It's kind of interesting because on some websites they actually have some interesting console log output. Um, like this is a this is a message that Facebook says in their code. Stop. This is a browser feature intended for developers. If someone told you to copy paste something here to enable a Facebook feature or hack someone's account. It is a scam and will give them access to your Facebook account. So this developer's console is, of course, for us developers, but also for hackers and, and, and crackers and the bad guys and all of that. And now, because I want to see who's looking at my Facebook account, there's so many tutorials out there that say, copy this code into the console and you're going to be able to see who's spying on you. Well, that is someone giving you bad code to hack yourself. And so now Facebook is, <laughs> Facebook is having to output a message here that when it detects that you're in the console, unless you know what you're doing, you're about to hack yourself. So just for fun, if you ever look at other people's uh, sites while you're in the console, you might get interesting output. In all yeah, all of the web browsers uh, pretty much have F12. Some of them might have a different sort of, um, some of them might have a different uh, keyboard shortcut, and you can usually get to it 
um, somewhere in the menu, somewhere we'll say developers options if it's not F12. And sometimes you can also right click and you might have maybe inspect element or developers tools. Uh, question in the back? No? <coughs> question? Yeah, question? Okay, I'll be there one quick moment. Question? Yeah, um, in Chrome, how do you get to the storage? How in, you find it? They have it in a different icon. Let's see, what do they call it? Um, application. So if you, um, if you don't see it right away, you can go to the double arrow application and you'll see your, um, your local storage and all that good stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to refine this if-else statement just a bit to make it a little bit more user-friendly. But for fun, you can look at the F12 for different websites. So the, um, this whole login, logout system uh, has a lot of nuances. And, and one of them that I want to address is right here, in that when you um, create, I'm in the sign up screen, and when you create a brand new account, when I create a brand new account, join, I get feedback in the console, but the user isn't getting any feedback. And what I was saying earlier uh, was that really, as you, you as a developer, you can look at that stuff and debug it and troubleshoot. But the regular user is never going to look at that F12. And there is a way to actually look at, uh, to use the developer's console on a device as well, plugging it in and setting it up right, which we'll talk about later. You will be able to do F12 to look at what's happening on a device. Well, uh, the user is not going to hit F12. They expect something to happen here. If I didn't have F12 open, think of yourself in the, in the shoes of the, of the user. I'm here on their account. I mean, I'm here in their app. It sounds really cool, CBDB. I do have a collection I want to save. Great, I'm going to create an account. And um, as I go through this process, and I click Join, what happened? I, I click Join. I didn't get any feedback. It didn't tell me anything as the user. So we have to think about in terms of 
uh, you know, back end and front end. In the back end is all of our code and our development tools. And in the front end is the user, the one that doesn't have access to that or wouldn't think to look in that and shouldn't have to look at that. So we need to make some sort of feedback here. Great, you created the account. Log in with it. That's the user experience that I'm getting at. You often see that, don't you, when you make, uh, when you make an account in a website or an app. You just created an account, now log in with that account. So I want to make a pop-up that tells them, you created the account, now log in with it. This is going to be similar to the, uh, to, the pass, uh, to the passwords don't match and stuff. I want some kind of pop-up for the user that is triggered via JavaScript. So that means we need to first create what will appear for the user in the HTML. We need to create whatever message we want to display to them in the HTML. And then we need to trigger it to happen in the JavaScript. Let's go to our index.html file. Let's go to line 45 or so. 43, I've got the error message, don't match. I've got the next line, account exists. Next line, we're going to create another pop-up here that's, that says, you know, you've successfully signed up and a, um, a, a button that will take them to log in. So this one's going to be a little more complex than the previous one, but it's still going to be started off as a div. We've got another div that'll be a pop-up. It is going to also behave as a data role pop-up. This one's sort of going to be a little bit more upgraded than a um, plain old pop-up. So we're not going to add class to this, but we're going to add uh, data-dialog equals true. It's going to behave a little bit more like a dialog box as opposed to a simple pop-up. Data dialog true and it's spelled like this way not the other ways. Dialog like that. It's spelled dialog not dialog. Data dialog true behave like a dialog box We're going to add another data attribute here. Data dismissible equals false. This is what I was saying about you can click outside of these pop-ups to dismiss them, which might be a problem if people are just click happy and they just click everywhere. What did I just dismiss? This pop-up will not dismiss unless you click something in the pop-up itself. And it needs an ID so that we can access it via JavaScript. So this is getting a little long here, but now this will be pop. Success. Sign up. So it's a pop-up. This time it's a success message in the sign up screen. And this one's going to be different because it's going to have a little bit more styling and such. So I'm actually going to break the div tags, multiple lines here. It's getting a little small. So this, these divs were very simple messages. I kept them on one line, opening and closing divs. This div will be a little more complex. We'll show a little bit more. Plus the data roles are different no class on that. And I'm going to break the div into multiple lines because here I want to make it behave a little bit more like a real kind of screen. So I will have, I will give this a header and an article. On a full featured section, on a whole screen full, we had header for content at the top, article for content in the middle, footer for, art, for content 
at the bottom. So this is going to be a more complex pop-up with a little bit more design. This is a header, so it needs a data role header. Message that will appear in the header. Maybe something like welcome. Again, the terminology of this user-facing stuff, the front end, that's up to you, that's up to your style guide, meaning are we going to have messages, the classic messages of like success or you know the very sort of stoic or dry messages of the past or if you look at modern software, modern websites, it's very personal, it's very friendly. You know, if you've got a Windows 10 machine, uh, you know, if you've got Cortana, it's very personal and Siri is like, I don't know how to help you with that. You know, things like that. So how do you want your 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 verbiage to be? That's all up to you. So at the very top here, it'll it'll say, well, you've created an account. Welcome. You've got an account. The actual article. Here's where we add the um, role of main and the class of UI content. <clears throat> It's just role because it's article. This is the special case. We had class UI content on the divs above so that basically the pop-ups up there are not transparent and oddly designed. In here we've got UI content, the class set to the article. We'll create a paragraph here of stuff to say. <coughs> and again, whatever we want, however you want to say this at some point, I'm just going to make it say, uh, thank you, ready to go. Break the line. There'll be an A tag here with a login button. On the very first PG welcome screen, we have the two options, log in, sign up. We've been spending our time so far in the sign up uh, screen, sign up section, PG sign up. After successfully creating an account, it's time for the person to go log in. So either when they load up your app, they're going to go to log in, they've got an account, or uh, they're going to sign up. And yes, eventually we will set it up so that once the person creates the account, it will auto-log them in. We'll get to that. But now uh, they've created the account. We thank them. Ready to go. There's going to be a button. This is a link. href pg login. I think that's how it's spelled. Data roll button. So it looks like a button. Unless you specify it, so the default animation will be fade. So I'll do a data transition flip. I've been using flip very consistently over and over in my app so far. Again, we have all of those possible transitions. And just because they're there doesn't mean you should use them all. You should use them with a purpose. Normal navigation will be flips. Other kinds of navigation to pay attention to might be a page turn. Maybe saving the data will be a transition of flow. So based on how you're navigating through the app, you have these dip, you have these choices of animations, transitions. You can add an icon to it if you want. I think we use the user icon on PG Welcome, so you can put an icon if you want. We'll make a note here, and then we'll get back to the JavaScript. These two pop-ups at the top are basic pop-ups. This one that we just created here, a more complex jQuery mobile pop-up. Note the differences. You can make a note on top, basic jQuery mobile based error pop-up messages, those two. Then this one here is a more complex one.
even though this type of div is more complex than the two ones up there, the way we invoke it, or the way we run it, or the way we use it in JavaScript is the same as the way we did those basic ones. So that means we need to create jQuery-based objects of this ID first. Then we need to initialize the pop-up. Then we need to run the pop-up. So confirm that this is filled in right. Save it. We'll go back to the uh, JavaScript. We need to create an object for this HTML node, for this HTML element, and then do the pop-ups. So I'm going to save the HTML, jump back to JavaScript, go to the very top. Created an element for that error pop-up, and that error pop-up, we need a new one. Remember to change that to a comma, because if you simply start writing, I'm going to create a brand new element. That'll be wrong because this var ended right there. And if I don't say var again, this will give me an error. It'll say, what are you trying to do here? Are you creating or selecting? What are you doing? So the line above, change that to a comma, and then we can do uh, l popup, l pop success. We're calling this L pop success. Sign up. It's basically the same name as the uh, as the ID plus L. That's equal to the jQuery selector end of statement. So uh, I, I'm actually um, I like doing. I personally like doing it this way. Uh, that one var then is chained <coughs> to four things. But you have to remember to put the chain, the comma. It has an official name, I can't remember it at the moment. But if that is confusing, it is perfectly fine to do var this semicolon, var this semicolon, and do vars on each one so that it's obvious that you're creating a variable. But I like doing it this way. Quotes. Pound, pop, success, sign up. So that so then that now gives us a sort of a keyword or a nickname or a shortcut to reference that HTML node in JavaScript. You just have to remember that's what it's named. Once that exists, we'll go back to our if-else statement, where we've um, set up our code that, yes, the passwords match, no, the user doesn't exist, local storage set item that will make this pop-up happen. We've saved the account. We'll make this pop-up happen to then let the person go sign up. If we go back after after setting item, resetting the form, now pop up. Now prepare the pop up. Then pop up the pop up or open the pop up and animate it. So 
exact same syntax as, as the other two times we did it, but just with different object names. Same methods, pop-up method, different objects, same options here, or same uh, parameters, open, then same options, transition flip. Save it and run it, save both your files. Right, we were editing the HTML and the JavaScript. Run it and create a brand new account. You should get a pop-up that appears for success. You should not be able to click outside of the pop-up to close it. There'll be a button, login. Click login, and it should take you to PG login. From mine, I'm going to sign up with a brand new account. Join, pop up, welcome. I try to click outside, doesn't close shouldn't close got the messages here login button click that goes to PG login ready to log in with your brand new email and password which doesn't work yet if you even though I just created the account cat at dog.com with my password uh, cat if I try to go there probably get some errors that's fine that's normal we haven't set up the login screen yet we've been spending all of this time setting up the sign up screen I have accounts that have been saved but the login is not ready yet let's pause for our first break here make sure our code works it's about 720 ish we'll be back at 730 if your code doesn't quite work call me over if it does take a break